Suicide is the second leading killer of people in the college age population. It may not be easy, but talking about suicide and mental health could save a life. From the Marquette Wire, this is the Breaking the Silence Town Hall Forum. Here is your host, Hannah Kirby. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. This evening, we're going to break the silence and have a conversation about the S word, suicide. We're going to hear personal stories from a couple of very brave individuals. We're going to learn the roles depression and anxiety can play. And we're also going to find out how every single one of you can help save lives. I'd like to start the evening off by introducing you all to two very strong individuals. This is Claire Schuster, a mother whose son Tim died by suicide in 2008. And this is Marie Crow, a Marquette sophomore who contemplated ending her own life. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Um, to start off, Claire, could you share your son Tim's story with us? Um, this is our son, Timothy John. He's our youngest son. And he was a senior at Grafton High School. And December of 08, he took his life. Um, I came home from a hair appointment and found him floating in our hot tub. And um, completely a shock to all of us. He, uh, in hindsight, um, he did show classic signs of depression. We did get him help his last two months or one month after, um, before he passed. And um, he was very involved in the community and in school. He played basketball, baseball, football. He played drums, piano, guitar. His band practiced in their basement. He was very active at school, very popular. And um, his last uh, t last year of his life, he did suffer some very deep, legit losses. He lost two close friends in a car accident that he had his whole life. He lost his two dogs that he had his whole life. Um, he had an injury uh, his the beginning of his football season, senior year, that took him out for the season. And um, soon after that, he started to tell Dad and I that he had no friends. And we just were amazed by that because I mean, our house was the meeting house. And um, he did begin to withdraw. And um, he wanted to sleep more. He lost a little bit of weight. And um, we took him in for professional help. He, like I say, saw a counselor and um, they gave him an antidepressant and told him to come back in three weeks and he was gone in 19 days. Um, he had clean toxicology, and um, they worked on him for another 45 minutes in the emergency room. He was a donor. He wanted to be a donor. And it was my mission then to speak up because as our community felt and all of our, his close friends since K-4 and his teachers, all his friends, parents, coaches, they all thought, holy crap, if it could happen in our family, in their family, it could happen to anybody. He didn't fit the stereotype. He didn't just break up with his girlfriend. He wasn't bullied. He wasn't struggling with his sexual orientation. He wasn't giving possessions away. He didn't talk about dying. He didn't attempt before, not that we're aware of. Um, he just helped us, helped me decorate the Christmas tree the night before. He loved Christmas. We just got him a new puppy 11 days before. And um, he left us a note that said, I love you all forever. And um, again, it's our mission to speak up because Tim felt alone. He felt like everybody else was having a wonderful, perfect life. Senior year, we would tell him, Tim just sucks. And everybody's comparing ACT scores, what schools everybody got into. And Tim was a strong C student. He studied and he got Cs. And with his dad and I, that was OK. Uh, we would tell him to, you, you're not defined by your grade point average. You're not defined by what schools you get into, what your report card says. You're defined as being a good, decent person. And you were a genius with all your talents that you had. And by your quick sense of humor, your quick wit, he had such spot on impressions that he just made us laugh all the time. And um, 
he took us all by surprise. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Claire. Um, could you tell your story, Marie? Yeah, of course. Um, over the summer, I, well, actually, I've been struggling with um, depression and anxiety disorder since my senior year of high school. I'm now a sophomore. So over the summer, I was just having a depression episode and then multiple anxiety attacks. And the one person that I had as my support and counted on just didn't want to be there for me at the time. So I decided to like go for a walk and try to distract myself because I also struggle with self-harm every once in a while. So on that walk, I found myself um, above a bridge in my hometown. And that's when I was contemplating taking my life. And I'm very lucky that my dad called me at that time. So he came and picked me up. And then I was surrounded by a few friends. But at the time, I still felt alone. And I think that's what a major theme is, that you feel alone. So then a week or so later, I was um, having the episodes again. And then I did not have my support there again. And that's when I did have the same urges. And seeing how that affected my dad and my family the first time is when I really decided that I needed to get help. So that's when I sought, um, I actually checked myself into a mental hospital for a few days. And then after I got out, I learned how to take care of myself and how to be there for myself. And I believe that's something that we all need to do. So that's why I decided that I would share my story, so I started a blog, I started different ways to express myself. So I just really want to help those around me because no one's actually alone and we're, everybody is always there for you and even though it may seem like you're alone and that it sucks right now, you'll be okay and just wait it out a little because it's not the end and you can keep going. And what was it like to take that step to get help? It was really hard because I knew I wouldn't be able to talk to anyone. I'd be by myself, and that's what scared me the most. But being in the hospital, it just it gave me a lot of tools. It gave me the time I needed. It was scary, but it was the right thing to do, and it was very helpful. And then um, Marie now has dreams of being a mental health researcher. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I'm very into science. I work in a research lab here at school right now. Um, I just, I want to help people. I like to help what they're going through. I know what it's like to go through it. So I also like to look at the science side of it as long as the psychological side of it. So I'm, um, in my research lab, we're looking at depression and how it affects the neurons. So hopefully we'll find different ways to help that. And you're going to be doing some pretty exciting stuff over the summer to kind of work on that career path, right? Yes, yeah, so I'm working here um, at the summer research program at Marquette. Very cool. Well, thank you both so much for opening up about your personal experiences with us tonight. Um, up on the screen, we'll have resources. Um, so if you or someone you know uh, need to reach out or have support, um, those contacts are available. Very good. Okay. Right. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Um, now we'll be watching a short video about two sisters who are starting conversations about depression and suicide in a pretty unique way. Suicide claims about 800,000 lives a year. That is mind-boggling and very, very sad. Yeah. And, and, you know, both our podcast and the World Health Organization say by talking, you know, by, by needing to vocalize your experience, by reaching out and connecting with another person, by asking for help, mm -hmm. um, that really is the first step. It is the first huge step, just talking about it. And that's what we're trying to do here is normalize depression and all of the things that relate to it. Terry McGuire and her sister Bridget are best friends. Together, they host a podcast, Terry in studio and her sister via Skype. We are literally giving voice to something that has not been talked about and has been sort of kept in the shadows. And we're hoping that by hearing it, you just understand it better. And, and now we're learning that telling it has a therapeutic value as well because you know, you're pulling the curtain back on your own secret. And so many share the same secret. Bill, Reed, Catherine, I mean, these are all people who 
reached out to us asking if we would interview them. In hope of helping others. And today we will talk with Medi Spies. I fought really hard to get to a place where I, I came out on the other side. I, I could see that beauty on the other side of depression and, and grief uh, of losing a loved one to suicide. The podcast is posted on their website, iTunes, and SoundCloud, but it all starts right here in the studio. In terms of actually, you know, waking up in the morning and going, let's do this, you know, it wasn't there. Uh, now it is, and, and that's a really nice thing. It's, it's a, you know, if this is my last job, um, I'm glad I picked one that is having an impact. From Splice Media Marketing, I'm Cheyenne Fisher for MUTV News. I am now joined by Terry McGuire, one of the women you just saw in the video who is giving voice to depression, and Dr. Barbara Moser, a, the chair of Prevent Suicide Greater Milwaukee. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight to talk about depression and anxiety. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So since we just watched the video about you, Terry, um, let's learn a little bit more about giving voice to depression. How did that idea come about? Both my sister and I have depression. We have lost uh, family members and friends uh, to suicide. and we were talking about the things that we could do at this stage in our lives in terms of both of us wanting to start a new project and a new, not just a career, but to, to make a difference instead of just make a living. And we realized that this was something we knew about and something we could help to bring voice to. And with the opportunity to be in different parts of the country and have access to different people in different age groups, she has younger children, I have older children, so we had access to some of their friends through social media. And we sort of just gave it a shot, and it was very different than we expected. Thinking it would be pulling teeth ended up being opening a dam. And then how has helping other people tell their stories helped you? Hmm. I think making it okay. I, I had never talked about my depression. I wasn't hiding it. It wasn't, I just didn't. I didn't think about talking about it. Uh, so when I did come clean to my family and to friends, real close friends, they were all surprised. So I think it reinforces for me that it's okay to talk about it, and I really enjoy being trusted and entrusted with people's stories and uh, moving forward something that I think has really been stigmatized, and I just don't understand. If you're sick from here down, you know, from an ophthalmologist to a podiatrist, and you can ask anybody, hey, do you know a good foot doctor, do you know a good, you know, ENT, anything. But from here up, you know, it's all private, and you're not allowed to ask, you're not supposed to talk, and I find that insane, because it's still your body, and it's still your physical health. So, you know, I, I like just getting stuff out there. I was a reporter, I was a crime reporter, and I like shining a light on things that shouldn't be dark. And depression and anxiety are especially problematic for college students um, since they're on their own for the first time. According to the Marquette Counseling Center, over 60% of students who visited the center had concerns with anxiety, and almost 50% had concerns with depression. Um, Dr. Moser, why is the college population so at risk? Well, they, the college population is leaving home often for the first time, leaving their family, friends, and they are having to organize their lives and really make decisions, perhaps on their own, that they have not had to make before regarding what classes to take, how to balance time, who their friends are, how much alcohol to drink, whether to drink, whether to use other substances. So there's lots of different factors that lead to a lot of angst and wondering, what should I do? Am I doing the right thing? Self-doubt. And so that does make college students vulnerable to, to anxiety and depression. But a lot of college students come come to college already with these diagnoses, or if they're not having the diagnosis, they have the symptoms already. So really, anxiety and depression present often much earlier in, in the teen years. Um, so 
you know, often it's really not a new presentation, but just a new situation that's making symptoms worse or making someone have to deal with them in a different way or on their own. And how do those concerns you mentioned factor into suicide? Well, depression and anxiety, especially in younger people, are huge factors in suicide. Um, thankfully, the, the vast majority, and this is a really important point, the vast, vast, vast majority of persons diagnosed with depression and anxiety do not attempt suicide. They do not take their lives. And this is a really important thing to know. But of persons who do attempt suicide, the majority do have a mental health diagnosis, the vast majority, perhaps as many as 90%. So that um, they, they are big factors when it comes to suicide. And what are some coping mechanisms you'd recommend for people who have anxiety and depression? Coping mechanisms really are something that everybody needs to think about and personalize for themselves. And I think really thinking about it ahead of time helps coming up with a plan. How, how am I going to cope with things when they don't go right? Grades, relationships, et cetera. And some coping mechanisms are things that we all know about, like exercise, getting enough sleep, um, not drinking too much, uh, not drinking at all, having a good balance between the time you study but also the time you take for yourself because it's very important when you're giving, giving, giving to relationships, academics, that you refill the tank for yourself. So some things people don't think about sometimes are things like, um, Meditation, mindful self-compassion is a technique where you really give yourself compassion and it's something to learn about and think about. Many of us are really hard on ourselves, very judgmental and if we can give ourselves some of that kindness, it really can go a long way. Just sometimes taking a quick mini vacation, a walk. Um, you know, imagining that for five minutes you're somewhere that you delight in being in the mountains at a beach. I mean, some of these things can be really, really very helpful. And I think the other thing is to know who you can talk to, to have that, those phone numbers, those emails, know who you can talk to, who you can trust, and who you're going to reach out to when you're in distress. I was going to add the same oh, yeah, way sure. that the doctor said to, to be aware of those things that, as you said, fill your tank when you're in a good space so that you're not having to think of those when you're in a dark place because nothing sounds like a very good idea when you're there. But another thing is to sort of have something set up with a close friend, whether that's your roommate or, you know, uh, it could be a sibling or whoever you're close to. And you say, hey, when I'm in that place, you know, if you haven't seen me in a while or if, you know, I'm, I'm asleep a lot or if you know I'm missing classes, check in with me and give them permission and say, you know, when I'm like that, I'm going to tell you I'm fine, I'm just tired. That's what we all say, I'm fine, I'm just tired. But if, you know, say really, you know, and say, well, let's, let's take a walk, let's go get a chai or something. And, and if you still feel like sleeping after that, you know, I'll leave you alone for an hour. But it, it helps to have those safety things in place when you can talk about it like we are right now. Because when I'm curled up in bed, you know, I, I don't, I'm not, hey, listen, I could really use, you know, a movie night. I, I'm not there. If somebody asked me for one, I would say, oh, no, I'm, you know, just so busy. But it helps, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think that, you know, people who know they have depression or anxiety and have had these um, problems really put them in a very dark place, <laughs> To have these safety plans in place is really important, and that's something that we can all think about. Parents, um, professors, obviously therapists who are involved, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners who are involved too. If we know that somebody we know has depression or anxiety, 
to suggest, hey, so I know you're doing okay right now, but you know, what, what are you gonna do when things get hard? What are you gonna do when, when you're not coping so well? How can I help you? Great. To really be proactive about mm -hmm. it. Terry, I know when we previously talked, you talked about your roommate from college um, mm -hmm. and how she had depression. Could you tell us how you helped her? I wasn't very well equipped because we didn't have anything like this. I mean, I had never, it wasn't something we talked about at home. It wasn't something we talked about in high school. It was the first day, I was 17, and I'm in Madison, and you know, she was a little older than me. I think she was 19 or 20, and the first night she told me something that had happened to her in her life that had you know, rocked her and that she was suicidal, and I thought, God, this is what college is like. You know, it just, I had no idea what to do. And I talked to her and, you know, we got through the first couple of days and I thought, I am in so over my head here. And I ended up calling her parents because I didn't know what else to do. And I just said, hey, why don't you come and visit? And they said, well, we're coming on Parents' Day. And I said, no, why don't you come and visit this weekend? I think you and your daughter need to talk. And we roomed for four years. We were very close friends. It wasn't like that was you know, a, a turning point in our relationship. But it was a turning point for her because she started therapy and, and they now knew what had happened to her as a child and, you know, she started to get the help she needed. So it ended up being the right thing even though, you know, it sounds like a, a bad thing to do these days, you know, calling somebody's parents. But it was all I knew to do. I think you did the absolute right thing Thank because you. it's, you know, it's so much better to reach out and make that call and to have risk somebody being mad at you right or losing a friendship than having a dead friend. Yes. Truly. Yes. So, you know, anytime you can reach out and intervene, you want to step up and do it. Absolutely. And what would you tell a student um, who might be afraid to get help on their own? Well, I think that you can ask a friend to go with you. You can learn more about what it's like to see a counselor. The counseling centers have Lots of information on websites and, um, you know, so that it's not a mystery what's going to happen when you go to get some help. There are different people you can talk to. If going to a counselor seems too difficult, if you have a trusted personal caretaker like a physician or a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, you can reach out to them. But often, you know, there are other people in your life. People often have um, a religious organization, which they're very connected to. So a, a priest, a pastor, a rabbi can be a huge support. There are other people to reach out to. There are also resources that are uh, available by text, mm -hmm. online chat. Uh, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline has an online chat feature. The Hope Line um, is a text line. There are, are different levels of reaching out, and so it can go in steps. As long as, you're, as long as a person isn't really actively planning suicide, you have usually a little bit of time to reach out and use some of these steps. But if somebody, if you hear, I'm going to take my life, I'm, I have a plan, I have the method, I have a gun, the person is using drugs or alcohol, that is a very risky situation. You have to act then, you can't wait. And I would say that there's no shame in it. I don't under, I still don't understand. I mean, I, I wouldn't be sitting here if I felt shame. I would rather be on a panel of people who'd won the lottery or something, but I'm, I'm here for this. So I get, I, I, I don't understand how it got to this point in society. It literally is also part of your body. So if your teeth hurt, you're going to go see a dentist. You know, it's just that. I, when I raised my children, I called it the feeling doctor. I said, you know, if your teeth hurt, you see a tooth doctor. If your feet hurt, we see a foot doctor. If you're confused about your feelings, we need to see a feeling doctor. And I'd take them and just let them have a couple of sessions because there were times, again, I felt like I was not sure I was doing it right or the mom. You don't want to talk to your mom sometimes. Uh, and then I, they'd balance out a little bit and we'd carry on again until the next time I thought they needed it. There's just... I don't understand the stigma. I live with it, apparently, and <laughs> we'll see how this all works out for me. But I, I think you just have to get whatever help you need whenever you need it. And it's a, not just a brave thing, but you have a responsibility to yourself. And you have a responsibility to your friends and to each other to just get whatever help you need. Yeah. 
Thank you both so much for all of your insight. We're going to actually move on to audience Q&A. So if anyone has a question for Terry or Barbara, um, please head over to one of the mics at the front and um, ask whatever question you would like. Uh, hi, so I know that you talked about um, through your radio show trying to normalize uh, mental like illness as well as um, that conversation about um, suicidal tendencies. So what advice do you have for students, you know, working to create an environment where people feel comfortable um, not only with mental health but also, um, you know, where people feel comfortable coming to you as like a source of um, support when facing those kind of feelings? I think one of the things that you have which is amazing is this, and you have the newspaper and the radio and the magazine, and all of those things are a springboard for you to have those conversations. So if someone that you're speaking to and you say, hey, did you see that town hall thing, and they make some comment that lets you know they're not the appropriate or safe person to have that conversation with, bring it up with somebody else. And if they say, yeah, that's been an issue for me, or you know, I grew up and my mother was depressed, now you've got the person you can talk to, and you've got a trusting environment, and it has to be that, because there's just no point. I, I, I talked to my mother, who's 93, and told her I was gonna do this, and she said, well, you don't have depression. You know, you're the funny one, what do you mean? And why is there stigma? And I said, because people think we're, you know, whatever, different, broken, unreliable, and she said, oh, definitely, definitely. And I said, <laughs> it's me, you rely on me. And she's like, oh, I do, what was I thinking? You know, so sometimes it's just cluelessness, um, not, not, not anything mean, no bad intention, just misinformed or uninformed. So I think you have to sort of feel it out and it has to be safe. I encourage people to tell their stories, but only if they feel safe doing it. So I'm assuming from your question and the way you phrased it, you'd be a pretty safe person to talk to. So there he is. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for your insight, ladies. Um, so when we were talking about uh, coping mechanisms, uh, neither of you mentioned medication, which I thought was interesting because, as you said, there's no, no difference if you had a headache, you would take you know, some Advil. So what are your thoughts? Why do you think there's this approach avoidance um, with taking medication? I have a couple friends who are clearly they have depression and they don't want to take antidepressants. They don't want to put something in their body that's unnatural or whatever, what they perceive as unnatural. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, when, when I think about coping mechanisms, I guess I'm thinking about what a person can do for themselves. And so a medication would require, you know, seeing somebody and, and getting a prescription. Medications, can be hugely helpful in treating depression and anxiety. Um, I, I, I too live with depression, have been on antidepressants for many, many years. Yes, I. They've helped me mm -hmm. tremendously. And it depends on the person. Really, for mild and even moderate depression, uh, talk therapy, seeing a therapist regularly, has been proven to be just as effective as medications. Um, so when, when the depression becomes worse, then definitely combining medication and psychotherapy or therapy, talk therapy, does work better than either, either one alone. But really, you need that combination. There, is a lot of stigma around taking medication. And I'll share with you that I have had myself stigmatizing uh, episodes with seeing a physician and deciding whether or not it was safe to disclose that I was taking an antidepressant. And I have at times not told that person because I did feel shame about it. And so it can be a difficult thing. I don't anymore, and I have started, you know, talking and sharing. But 
this is a you know fairly recent thing for me. So, you know, and I'm a physician, so I know how to manage my drug interactions, you know, but God forbid somebody's on a major um, antidepressant with, with side effects and drug interactions and feels that they don't want to open up. So that's not exactly your question, but I'm just trying to, you know, put some context around why sometimes people don't want to go on medication. Am I in favor of medication when they're for the right person, for the right reason, properly described, prescribed, yes, I, I am. And, you know, I'm living proof of that, mm -hmm. that, you know, medications do help. I do hear that from people. I'll have people, you know, talk to us for the podcast, and they'll tell us some just harrowing tales of, you know, horrible nights and suicidal ideation. And I'll ask, you know, how do you address your, your uh, depression? And some of them are like, well, not medicine. And I go... Wow, really? Because have you ever talked to somebody about it? But I want to make the point that I have never seen a counselor or a doctor and had them say to me, you may be depressed, you may need to be on medicine. I have gone in and said, I think I'm depressed and I think I need to try something. And I have gotten it and it has helped. And I go off it because I feel better and that's what tends to happen. But, you know, very recently, last couple of months, you know, went back on and, you know, here I am. But... Um, not that I'm doing a dance or anything, I'm just sitting in a chair, but I can do this. Uh, and, I, and I couldn't, you know, so I think that we have to be proactive and our own advocates, and I think sometimes you have to be the person who goes in and says, you know, I know sad, and this seems different, or this has lasted longer, or this is darker or deeper. And, you know, we have to be the people who advocate for ourselves if nobody else is there holding our hand doing it. Thank Good. you both Thank so you. much for talking with us Thank tonight. You. That wraps up our first Q&A. And um, now we'll hear an original poem called Tidal Waves from Rachel Harmon of the Live Poet Society. Okay, it works. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. This is Tidal Waves. Don't blame me for my fear of drowning when nearly 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Drinking the doctor recommended 64 fluid ounces of water daily, I am drowning myself from the inside, slowly killing myself in the name of fear. My insides are churned by sea sickness inducing currents, pushed and pulled by my own tropical storms and tidal waves. I am not pristine waters. I am tsunamis and flash floods. Dropped pebbles do not send out even and photogenic ripples from my core. Instead, they land like metal tons and tombstones. I am not peaceful. I am irregular, unpredictable, moody, tragic, shaky, dramatic, unsteady. I am suffering, leaking, taking on water. I am breaking. I am a cargo ship destined to crash. A devastating shipwreck set on its fated course. I am meant to burn. I am meant to die. I am not the glamorous yacht coasting along the tropical spirits of the Bahamas. I am not a sailboat peacefully wading on the still morning water, basking in natural glory. I am not you, them, him, her, whoever. I am suffering from my own sabotage. I have punched and kicked hole after hole into the bottom of my vessel. I can see that I am on my way to drowning, but I kind of want to be. I've tried flooding my anxiety, waterboarding my suicidal desires, and sinking my entire way of being, but I'm still breathing, still afraid. I'm still suffering, leaking, taking on water. I'm still the same. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that piece with us, Rachel. Now we'll watch a quick public service announcement with one of our next guests. Hi, my name is Amy Lovell, and I'm a registered QPR instructor with the QPR Institute and Prevent Suicide Greater Milwaukee. QPR stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. It's a suicide prevention training to help people learn how to ask the question 
of someone if they're thinking of killing themselves, how to persuade someone to live, and how to refer them to resources. If you or someone you know is struggling, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 to get help. Now we're going to talk about intervention, warning signs, and what you can do to help save lives. We are very lucky to have these next three individuals join us this evening. Amy Lovell is the co-founder of RedGen, an organization that advocates for youth mental illness. And Dr. Michael Zabrowski has been the director of Marquette's Counseling Center since 2004 and is a licensed psychologist. And Peter Huffel is the executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Greater Milwaukee. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be here tonight. Um, starting with Amy, could each of you give us one of the strategies you use when talking to someone about suicidal thoughts? Sure. I think the biggest thing is to always use empathy and to be non-judgmental. Um, somebody who is in that deep, dark place is um, very vulnerable. And so to just be um, patient with them, empathetic, and non-judgmental, and to sit with them and let them talk, but also not to be afraid to ask the question because it's really important to ask the question because, and to ask it with, in a non-negative way. So to ask directly, like, I can see you're really upset. Are you having thoughts of killing yourself? And not to ask, like, you're not thinking of killing yourself, are you? Because if you ask in that negative way, it's sending them the message that you're too scared for the answer or you want them to say no. So you, you have to give them time to be able to talk freely and to not be scared of getting a yes. Um, Dr. Zabrowski, what's one of the strategies you use? Yeah, I think it's helpful to um, help people to feel more hopeful about things because oftentimes when people are having suicidal thoughts, they feel hopeless. So I will often say, um, I know it's really hard for you to come here today. Uh, I want you to hold on if, if those uh, feelings and thoughts are pretty strong. Um, let us help you. Well, we know how to help you. I'll get a safety plan in place with that person and kind of figure out what the next week is going to look like before, uh, before I see that person again. But I really try to communicate that you're not by yourself. Um, thank you so much for coming and talking to me, and I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And Peter, what is the strategy you use? Yeah, so the, I couldn't agree more with the other two panelists. Um, non-judgmental is huge um, and also that hope um, and not putting any sort of negativity on your conversation you want to actively listen to that individual and by active listening it's it's really being there being very open to listen to them um, a lot of times as humans we want to fix a problem and when you're listening to somebody it's not the time to fix a problem it's to listen to them and to let them know that you're actually there for them to listen to them um, and then you know be very honest with them, but also be positive. You know, do you have a plan? Um, I love you. I'm worried about you. Um, and ask them you know, to describe what they're going through. Um, and be, allow them to feel that they can trust you. And that is being, I think, an active listener is being there with empathy and grounded in, in, the, in the situation. Because if you're not grounded and you're not there wholly, they'll be able to tell that and they may just tell you what they think you want to hear rather than being honest with you. So I think that's the key thing. And as we learned in the first segment, um, suicidal thoughts can start much before um, college or before someone steps foot on a campus. Um, Amy, a lot of the work you do is with pre-college youth, um, and it focuses on building resilience. Why is that? Um, I think it, it's because if, you, like going to what you said, of being hopeful and knowing that um, you can bounce back and that, um, hard times are going to come, but you can get through them and you can persevere. Um, in today's culture, there's so much stress on kids and they are kind of put into a box of one path to success. And I think that there's more than one way to get where you want to go. So if, you're, if you are having struggles, you can get through them and there's, it's, doesn't have to be the way everyone else does them. And um, we had several suicides in 2013, and one of them was a 13-year-old girl who was a good friend of um, our daughters. And so we just saw these youths 
really struggling and wanted to do something and we decided to focus on resilience because it was positive. It wasn't, you know, it, people could talk about resilience more openly. And Dr. Zabrowski, what are some of the warning signs to look out for when it comes to suicide? Well, um, like someone had mentioned before, um, what the statistics or research show is that about 90% of people who uh, attempt suicide have a, probably a diagnosis of depression. So um, those symptoms are um, having eating or sleeping difficulties, having a low mood, lacking pleasure, um, making statements about having a lot of guilt and feeling uh, worthless. Um, but you might also notice someone crying, someone isolating themselves, um, someone being more irritable than uh, normal. So I think we, we all read people really quickly when we meet them. You know, you ask somebody, how are you doing? And they say, fine, and we know they're not fine. And then sometimes we let it um, rest there. And it's up to us to kind of ask more about, well, you don't seem fine, what is going on? And to try to figure it out, um, and maybe even to ask, are you feeling depressed? Are you feeling more down more than usual? And then, as Amy had said, um, if you have any indicator, even it's like a coded statement, like I just don't feel like being around much longer, we have to ask that question, um, are you thinking about suicide? Which can be really hard to do. Um, and I know we do training with people, everyone says afterwards, it is, it's hard to get those words out, especially if it's um, a loved one. And then um, if you see someone exhibiting those signs, what else can they do? Um, what's most important is to get that person help, right? So um, th there's lots of ways you can do it. You can take someone to the ER, you can call 911. Um, but uh, here on campus, um, you can bring somebody over to the counseling center. We always have somebody on call, and so somebody can just walk in, and we will see them as soon as possible and ask those questions and figure out uh, what to do. But there are lots of administrators and faculty on campus um, that also know what to do. Um, so people can approach them as well, too, and they, they will get them to the counseling center. After hours, there's MUPD who will contact us or hall directors. So there's just so many people. Um, and what we know is that um, students, um, college age population, um, they're not necessarily going to tell us as administrators, they're going to tell their friends, their peers. And so those peers then um, need to get help. They need to tell somebody, hey, I'm concerned about my friend, could you please talk to them? And not to leave that person alone until they get the help they need. And Peter, how does NAMI serve as a resource for college students dealing with mental illness? So for college age students, we have uh, support groups at our, at our office once a week. It's free for any mental health diagnoses. It's run by individuals that are in recovery with their own mental health diagnoses. Um, you, know, you can find it on our website. And it's you know, every Saturday at our office from 10 to 11.30. Um, but then we also have peer-to-peer -peer classes, which are free classes where you can learn to better manage your own mental health diagnoses, learn strategies on wellness, developing a crisis plan, um, learning how to um, you know, maintain your own wellness. Um, oftentimes, through a clinical setting or hospital setting, they don't necessarily give you the tools for follow-up. Uh, we have wellness recovery action planning where we do classes on that where individuals can learn to, to develop their own wellness plan, their toolbox, their, you know, develop a crisis plan, a post-crisis plan to just, to be on, to actually take ownership of, of your illness and learn to live with it like you would diabetes. And that's what our support groups and our peer-to-peer -peer classes do. Um, unfortunately, it's, you have to be at least 18 years of age for our um, services, but I think most of the students that on campus are. And then we also um, refer people to Active Minds, which is on campus here at Marquette. So it's good that you have that here. And as we saw in the PSA, um, Amy is a QPR trainer. Um, what are the benefits of this training? I think the training allows you to just learn more, to educate yourself, and to learn um, how hard it is to ask that question because we'll do a role play and you'll see that you can trip yourself up um, when you're trying to ask and also um, how to persuade somebody to choose life by promoting hope and looking at their protective factors like what things they have to live for and then also resources knowing what resources are out there to get someone help it's just a good training. It's like CPR, like so many people get trained in CPR for cardiac events and QPR is similar to that. It's just for mental health crisis events and it's, it's important that people recognize warning signs. And how can students get QPR trained? So um, 
Here on campus, uh, we will offer general QPR trainings. So we'll advertise them. Sometimes they're um, aligned with mental health, mental health Awareness Week or Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and so we'll advertise those and send those out uh, with the Marquette uh, Bulletin. Um, we train all the RAs um, in QPR. But people can also contact the Counseling Center and say, I have a group and we're really interested in learning about this. And we can go do a, a private um, kind of tutorial as well, too. Thank you so much for all the information. We'll now move on to our next uh, question and answer with the audience. So if anybody has any questions to these three professionals, please head up one of the mics. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. Um, a lot of times when we are helping students with mental illness, we tend to talk about like the resources that they have, but we don't really talk about the process afterwards. So I'm wondering um, what advice you would have for students or students who have friends who are struggling with like finding the right therapist or finding the right coping me me mechanisms. Um, so, oh, so how does a friend support someone else who's kind of started treatment? Yeah, and if they're like struggling to find maybe the best counselor or therapist for them or like whether group therapy is better but they're not having a lot of success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Therapy's hard, you know, and especially the first time people come for counseling, um, it's really hard to get there. And almost everybody says it, how uncomfortable they felt, they thought about not coming, and they came, and actually it, it felt okay. But sometimes it's hard to come back for the second appointment. So I think um, sometimes as a friend, it's helpful to say, you know, I think you should go back and, and just check it out again, and maybe talk to the counselor about how uncomfortable you're feeling, if, if they're feeling if they don't want to come back. But um, it helps to get recommendations. You know, you talk to your friends, you talk to people who know therapists, you kind of research people um, online. If um, people are, are finding someone outside of the counseling center, maybe you, you can contact us and ask us, who do you know in the area who do, uh, deals well with this issue? Because that's what we do. I mean, we, we kind of talk to our colleagues and friends and find out who uh, specializes in what and who's the best person. Um, and then I think as a friend, yeah, it, I think it just helps to be really encouraging. It can sometimes be a lengthy process, and it takes patience, and sometimes it feels worse before it feels better because you're starting to, to talk about things that are hard to talk about. And so you are kind of supporting as a friend and encouraging them to try some of the things that maybe therapy, the therapist has asked them to do. I, I also think if the fit isn't right, not being afraid to move on because most therapists know that that fit is important. So if there is a definite personality clash, not being afraid to say, I've got to try somebody else, but then supporting your friend to actually make that call, because the call is hard to make. Thank you. Can I just add a point to when somebody walks up? Yeah. So um, as counselors, too, it's really important for us to address differences with people. So. Um, suicide, and depression, and suicidal thinking goes across all ethnicities, racial groups. So as a white man counselor, I, I need to talk to my clients about our racial and identity differences and to ask, what's it like to talk to me about these issues that you're struggling with? We know that LGBT uh, people are twice as likely to attempt suicide. Trans people, um, one stat says that 40% of trans people will attempt suicide in their lifetime. That's huge. And so as a counselor, I have to be respectful of pronouns and what someone's name is and to know what their resources are and how to direct that person and not kind of um, inadvertently shame them or turn them off from coming for counseling. Hi. Uh, so I've been a party to a number of friends, varying severities of just like talking through things. And I feel honestly more comfortable in that. But uh, there have been a couple times where you know, it's not someone I know so much personally, but a close friend is being that kind of listening ear for somebody, and uh, they're feeling kind of helpless in like everything they're trying to like show, like I love you and I care for you. Like, what would you say to someone that's trying to like kind of work someone through that and feeling kind of helpless and losing themselves and trying to help somebody out? Well. Although I don't, I can't give you the specific answer. I know that NAMI are, are I wish I would have brought it with me. I probably wouldn't have brought enough copies, but there's actually online on the NAMI national website, there's how to help a friend. And it talks about pitfalls and certain things to do. And it's a really good handout, good resource. I would recommend looking at that. Um, but um, you know, it's a very, it's a very 
good question because that, you know, working at NAMI, we see that a lot where people just don't know what to do. And they're, they, they, they do like the person, they love the person, they may be the family member, and they don't know what to do. And it's, they're afraid they're going to tell the person the wrong thing. Um, and then they're not, you know, if they're afraid themselves or have fear, they may not be the best person to give that support. So it, it is a very good, you know, I, I, would, I would recommend is, is you have that conversation with that person that maybe they're not the right person to be in that support position if they're not feeling comfortable because it can be, you know, devastating for them and then maybe not helpful for the person they're trying to help. All right, well, that wraps up our last Q&A of the night. Thank you so much for talking with us. Um, now we'll hear an original poem called MASH by Ivana Osmanovich of the Live Poetry. You ask me to play MASH, the game where we take a pencil and circle it over paper, determining a future, afraid to tell you that I don't see myself having one, afraid to tell you that the house will never have me, that the lovers that have inhabited this heart will be the only wall ones to know these walls to be home, that there will be no two or 28 children, and that I would have never had the capacity of loving them anyways, or myself, or these legs that carry this body. They will never know the metro, the plane, or the car, but I'm not supposed to talk about these things. I'm not supposed to think about these things. I'm not supposed to talk about these things in public. I'm not supposed to want to ask you to make me sound like a decent human being when I ask you to speak at my funeral because no human should ever carry the sadness of another like a battered bag riding alone on the winding carousel on baggage claim long after everyone leaves. I'm not supposed to ask you to leave. I'm not supposed to be thinking about this. I'm not supposed to be thinking about this in public. So I tell you, so I chuckle, ignoring my participation in the game, letting silence settle on the brim of our conversation, whispering that only some girls get futures. Your pencil darts across the page, circling like thoughts in my head. You tell me to tell you to stop. I tell you that I never want. I tell you to tell me to tell this constant, constant, constant to stop. But we're not supposed to talk about these things. So instead, I tell you that I never want you to stop circling your pencil on the page, that I never want you to see an end, that I want you to go home after you have picked up your bag. But we're not supposed to talk about these things. No, we're not supposed to talk about these things in public. We don't talk about the blue bag in the Denver airport or the people that left it or the people that went home or the people that had homes because we're not supposed to talk about loneliness. We're not supposed to talk about these things. We're not supposed to talk about these things in public. We sit watching as you determine your future groom living in the shack with the 19 children you will have, how they will mirror yourself and him how you will pay homage in a church, your family will pay hom go, go, go in the streets safe with the protection you give them. We talk about your future. The cute bartender adding his name to the list, the strong gin in our drinks, because we're supposed to talk about those things. Yeah, we're supposed to talk about those things in public. Thank you for sharing that with us, Savannah. Now we'll watch a video about one of the people who are going to be in our next segment. The saying goes, it runs in the family. My dad is 6'6", my mom's 5'10", so I'm the shortest in my family at 5'9". These aren't the only things that run in the Fisher family. My mom and dad both play basketball at Marquette. My dad was a walk-on from New Jersey. My mom was top 10 in rebounding upon her graduation. I always say that my parents put like a basketball in my hand and Marquette in my heart. Jenny carries on her parents' athletic legacies from the press box. With Marquette Athletics, I'm a media relations assistant, uh, meaning that I work at basically every home event. But before Jenny got to Marquette, she suffered what she describes as a world-crushing tragedy. When I was 13 years old, I lost my mom to suicide. I still have memories of playing basketball in the driveway with my parents. It was, um, we would do, uh, my mom and I, the brown-eyed girls, against my dad and my older brother, Charlie. I guess I just hope my story can help someone feel comfortable enough that they can break their own silence or know that someone cares enough for them to stick around. From Marquette University, I'm Hannah Kirby, MUTV News.
while some people don't feel comfortable talking about the topic of suicide, others, including these next two guests, want to get this important conversation started. To finish off the evening, we're joined by Jenny Fisher, the Marquette sophomore you just saw in that video, and we also welcome Black Claire Schuster. Thank you both so much for talking about us, why there's a silence when it comes to talking about suicide. Um, Jenny, you're so open with your story. Why do you think it's important to share it? Um, I think it's important first off just because it's who I am. Um, I, it would almost take away, I feel, from my mom's life itself. Um, at the end of the day, a suicide is a death. Um, and so to silence it just because of means, I don't think is really fair. And um, what was it like when you first opened up about your story? Um, it took a while. <laughs> We're here, what, seven years later, and I'm talking about it and nearly losing my voice. But um, the first time I think I really talked about it, it was hard. Um, I didn't really want to wrap my head around it I, when I was 13. I didn't know what was happening. I was barely going through like puberty even. I didn't know what was happening at all in life. And so um, I think the first time talking to people about it really made me realize that you know, this is a valid thing to feel and to go through and that I'm not alone. And then Claire, as a mother who lost her child, um, what were some of the challenges you faced early on? Um, the obvious was that we became instant empty nesters, but I was also bound and determined that I didn't want Tim just to be known as the kid that committed suicide because he was so much more than that. He was a, a brother, a son, a cousin, uh, friend, grandson, and um, I kind of feel Timmy took one for the team to bring it out into the open because it was not talked about in 08 at all. And I'm so proud and thankful that a lot of the celebrities are coming out now that I know that the younger folks can relate to. Even the English royal family has recently spoken out and I just think that's awesome because it does help to share it. It lightens your load. It's, sometimes life is just too heavy for one person's shoulders, you need to share it. And how did you overcome the challenges of opening up and sharing it? Um, our faith, we, are, we live in a wonderful community, and our community, our church, really wrapped their arms around us and um, helped us through, because I, I feel, too, I, I went through a lot of grief therapy, support groups, and I'm a big believer that grief shared is grief diminished, and it, and it does help. We're still standing. We're still standing. I would add to that, too, <laughs> that I, I feel like there's, uh, I interviewed a woman for a journalism project a couple weeks ago, and she said to me, there's going to come a time in your life where you cannot do it alone. And she said that person for her was God, and that her faith really helped her through as well. So I would definitely agree that that was a huge part of it for me as well. And what advice, this question would be for both of you, um, starting with Jenny. Um, what advice would you give to people who want to join this conversation, kind of get it started? Ask questions, talk to people. Uh, people aren't really just going to come out and say things um, on their own always, but if you ask questions, if you genuinely, I, there are people in your life that care. I think that's also important. Mm -hmm. And so if you just talk to them, uh, before this I had dinner with my friend Mary and we were just talking about this and just talk about it casually and remember even though it can be kind of a fragile subject, um, it's nice to say their name every once in a while. It's nice to be able to reminisce and to talk about, hey, let's make sure this doesn't happen to anyone ever again. And it's an illness. You get sick. Just you know, The brain is an organ, just like your, your heart or your kidney. And there's, there's no shame into getting help and reaching out and getting help. And know that there's hope. And to all you young folks out here and listening, um, don't ever, ever, ever give up. Don't ever give up. The day you end your pain is the day you start ours. And we have to live with that now for the rest of our life. And I'll never be ashamed to be Timmy's mom. We're so proud of him to have him our son, and I thank God every day that he chose us to be his parents. And his death will not be for nothing because this is going to save lives. I know this is a really difficult topic to discuss, and I want to thank you both so much for being thank so you open so and sharing much. with us tonight. Um, let's give out all of our guests a round of applause for sharing. Thank you. All right. Um, this brings us to the end of our.
our program, please note that there are resources available on campus, including the Counseling Center and the Police Department. Once again, we have contact information on the screen. If you or someone you know is ever in immediate danger, always call 911. For more stories and videos from this project, please visit our website, marquettewire.org. And thank you all so much for coming and helping us break the silence. Good night. Thank you.